Amen. If you have your copy of God's Word, if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, I want to talk today about the fact that the church and the gathering, the corporate gathering of God's people on a weekly basis is one of God's gifts to us, a gift that he has given to us, a resource, a tool for accomplishing the purpose for which he has uh, saved us, created us, called us, redeemed us. And so I want us just to think about that for the next few moments. I mean, why did God design the church? Why did God put something else on the schedule for us to have to attend during the week? I'm sure most of your schedules are pretty Uh, are pretty packed, some of them with things you decided you wanted to do, some of them with things other people decided that you had to do. Uh, Maybe it's with a job, maybe it's with a honey-do list. There are lots of things on your schedule that you're required to accomplish. Why is it that God decided that, you know, we were supposed to meet together uh, for one other thing to add to our schedule? When you leave church today, If you look down at your gas gauge in your car and that bar is laying all the way down on the E and the light's on that indicates to you that you have low fuel, you're probably going to divert your trip home to stop by a fueling station. Maybe if you have a Tesla, maybe you'll stop by a charging station, but you're going to have to stop somewhere to refuel. After you fill up, then you'll drive home. Then you'll drive to work, then you'll drive to the golf course, grocery store, maybe a family member's house, maybe you'll drive to a football game at some point. Eventually, you'll deplete that supply once again. The fuel will run low again. Now, that that doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a driver. But even good drivers have to go back to the gas station to fill up with fuel consistently. Otherwise, you can't drive anywhere. Otherwise, you will run on empty, and the car just won't go. I think we've forgotten that God did not design the church for his benefit. God designed the church for our benefit. You need it. It is your supply and encouragement and energy for the week that is ahead of you. You need to come to his house and fill up. This isn't a new problem. The early church had an attendance problem as well. There was a deficit in their, in their attendance for some of the people that should have probably been there as well. People had found other things that they wanted to do. People had found other things to occupy their time. People had found other things that they felt like were more important than being in God's house. And the author of Hebrews tells all of the church why it's important for us to gather Together, as a matter of fact, one of the things he uses is he uses the phrase, let us, three times in this passage of Scripture we're going to look at. Let's read it together, and then we'll kind of walk through it uh, and see what this gift that God has given to us encourages us to do. Verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, here we go, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This gift to us that God has given to us encourages us to do certain things, to live a certain way. And one one of those is for us to live together, to encourage one another, to build up the body of Christ and courage and accountability and to live the life that he's called us to live. And frankly, it's not possible to do it on our own. Own. And so we want to look at just some of the things that he encourages us to do. The first thing that he tells us to do is we should worship together. In verses 19 through 22, he gives us something that maybe if you don't understand kind of the, the Hebrew um, 
uh, background to this. Maybe it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, but we're going to look at it. He says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Now, what is he talking about? That's a temple reference. He's talking about the temple and the holy places and the holy of holies, the holy the most holy place, no one could go in there except once a year. And the only person that could go in there was the high priest who could actually go into the most holy place in order to make a sacrifice, in order to offer a sacrifice on behalf of all of the people. Well, the problem with that now was that the sacrifice has been given. The sacrifice of Jesus, which is why he says, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. If you'll remember at the crucifixion, and, and you read the story of the account of the crucifixion, one of the things that happens that almost seems like it's in passing is that the veil of the most holy place has been torn when Jesus dies on the cross. And, and the significance of that is that now no longer do we have to rely upon a priest to go into the most holy place on our behalf. Now our high priest is Jesus who has torn the veil and given us access to the very presence of God. That's pretty important. So that's why he tells us that we can worship him because ultimately we can have confidence in him. Not in us, not in our goodness, not in our ability to do what needs to be done. But he tells us there in verse 19 through 21 to have confidence in him. And since we have a great priest over the house of God. Who is that? That's Jesus. Jesus has taken the place of any of the priests of the past. And because of that, Jesus made it possible for us to go into the presence of God, to come into his presence and to worship our, ourselves freely. You don't need me to worship. I don't need you to worship. But interestingly enough, we're encouraged to draw near to him. That's, that's the response, right? But it's not you draw near to him. It's not me draw near to him. It's not individually draw near to him. Look what he says in verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The, the pronoun that he's using there is a plural pronoun that we are supposed to collectively come together and worship because we have confidence in him. We can draw near to him. The other night I was watching a show on television. I'd been sucked into it. It was, uh, I, th I believe it was on the Discovery Channel. It's probably about snakes, to be honest with you. But uh, I I'd been kind of sucked into uh, what they were talking about. And I was watching it. I was sitting on, in my recliner, and the whole world had kind of faded away. Kids were in bed. Beth was probably doing laundry. That seems like normally what happens. Now, now, before you get too hostile against me, okay, I'd already done the dishes, okay? So she was still doing laundry, and I had sat down, and so I was watching this, this uh, show on, on television, and I'd been sucked into it, and the phone rang. Well, my phone was on the other side of the room because I had it charging, and so I got up, and I, I walked over to where the phone was, and I didn't want to miss anything, so I'm holding the remote in my hand, and my, I didn't pause it. I just kind of was trying to turn the volume up. And so I got over to the other side of the room, and I looked down at the phone, and I realized, okay, this is a call that I really need to take. And so uh, as I'm getting ready to take it, I'm trying to pause the television from the other side of the room, but nothing happened. And, and I was like, okay, that's not good. And so I'm, I'm thinking, what's wrong, with this? what's wrong with this remote? It's not working. And so I keep hitting the pause button. Like, you know, if you keep going down the same road, like you think, eventually I'll get to a different destination. That's not really the way that works. You keep going down the same road, you keep getting to the same place. And I just kept hitting the pause, and I'm hitting the remote and hitting pause. And it dawned on me, the problem is not the remote. The remote still works fine. The TV still works fine. There's no problem with those tools, those resources. The problem is I'm too far away from the TV. You know, this is our problem many times when we begin to blame God for some of the things that are going on in our life. Or maybe we begin to blame the church. Like, this stuff's not working, so why would I keep doing it? And many times the problem is not that God has done anything or that the church has failed in any way. Many times the problem is we're too far away. We've sort of removed ourselves from that resource, from that tool, and now it just won't work the way that it's supposed to be. Now, you may say, 
And you may ask the question, and I think it's a fair question, but why do I need the church to draw near to God? Can I draw near to God by myself? Well, the simple answer to that is, yes, you can, and yes, you should. You should absolutely draw near to God by yourself. But when you draw near to the Father, what you will find is that in order to be close to Him, His intentions are that you would also be close to His family. His desire is that as you draw near to Him, you'd also want to be with His children. Yes, but He's perfect and His children are not perfect. Well, well now there's a newsflash. My children aren't perfect either, right? Well, but we're constantly encouraging my children to interact in a way that shows that they actually love each other. Not that they just want to constantly fight all the time. That they really do like to be around each other. There's nothing more precious in the home and in the family when you see your kids actually interacting in a positive, encouraging way towards one another. The same is true with God's family. His desire is that the children, in spite of our imperfections, in spite of our mistakes, in spite of the things that maybe could divide us, that we would be willing to love Him and draw near to Him. If you don't want to be with His children now, what are you planning on doing for eternity? Like, for eternity? That's forever. That's, that's going to be a long time. What do you think it's going to be like? He has created a place for us that where He is, there we can be also, but that means we collectively get to be with Him forever and together we ought to have a desire to worship together even now. That's not the only thing He says. He tells us, let us one more time in verse 23, He reminds us that we should not only want to worship together, but we also ought to witness together. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Now, a couple things. Typically, when we think about witnessing, we think about our words. And that's important. Your personal testimony is of utmost importance to the mission that God has called you to. You ought to have a desire to go out and share with confidence the message and the confession of hope that you have in Jesus. If you have hope in Jesus, you ought to share it with others. In other words, you ought to share with your words. Tell the world where your hope resides. You ought to be willing to share that message of what Christ has done in your life. And the hope ought to be that as you share that message with others, that they would have a desire to want to also experience that themselves. Maybe they'll ask you questions. Maybe they'll want to come to church and see what it's like to be around people who have that same confession and so we we make this testimony we make this declaration we make this proclamation with our lips with our words that Jesus really does save that he really does transform that we really are not the same person that we used to be it really is important that we would share that message with others but not only do we share with our words you also share with your actions there was a man traveling through the Congo one time, and he came across kind of a strange sight. He saw this, um, this pygmy from a tribe uh, that was standing on top of a rhinoceros that he had just recently killed. And he said it was the weirdest sight. There's this small pygmy uh, man from a pygmy tribe standing on top of this massive rhinoceros. A and so he asked, did you kill this rhinoceros? And the man said, yeah, I, I killed it. He thought, wow, that's weird. Just out of curiosity, how did you kill it? It's so much bigger and far more dangerous than you are. And the, the pygmy tribesman said, well, I killed it with my club. And that now he's really confused. You killed it with your club? How big is your club? And the pygmy tribesman thought for a few moments and he said I mean I guess there's probably about a hundred or so of us you know part of the problem that we don't realize and recognize is that God has put us together to encounter the dangerous difficult violent chaotic world that we know we live in the evil that we live in that really is far too great for us to encounter on our own but we must rely upon him and he's given us each other in order to to accommodate those overwhelming odds that are against us. 
And part of our witness is not just that Christ is sufficient to save us, but that Christ has given us what we need in order to overcome. So we don't just share with our words, we also share with our actions. We show the world where our hope resides. In a world that's full of guilt, we are to proclaim and to show them that Jesus, that in Jesus there is hope for forgiveness. In a world that's filled with death, we proclaim to the world that in Jesus there is hope for life. In a world that's filled with hurt, we proclaim to the world that in Jesus there's hope for healing. In a world that's filled with war, we proclaim to the, war that, to the world that in Jesus there is hope for peace. In a world that is obviously filled with hate, we tell the world... That in Jesus there is hope for love. In a world that is filled with brokenness, we proclaim to the world that in Jesus there is hope for grace. Now how does it make any sense for us to say we put our hope in Jesus and then avoid being with the other people that say that they put their hope in Jesus? We ought to want to draw near to him and draw near to his people and say, yeah, you're imperfect and I'm imperfect, but the God we serve is perfect and we will testify with our words and with our actions that we must find our hope in him. Now, I just want to take just a moment and kind of shift off over here into something that we don't typically talk a whole lot about, but I do want to say this because we're, we're in a very tumultuous time in our nation. And here's one of the problems that I see on the horizon for many of us, even in the church, but all around our world is that we are putting our hope in individuals, in politicians, in candidates that maybe God will use and maybe God will not use. But if your hope is in a candidate, can I promise you something? You will be disappointed. They are always going to come up short. They will never do everything that you hope or expect or pray that they will do. Why? Because just like all the church members that we already have issues about, they're fallen, sinful, broken people who make mistakes. And sometimes they're going to do things they want to do that have nothing to do with what they should want to do. But there is one that you can put your hope in, that you can put your trust in, and you can share with your words and with your actions that your hope is in Him. Our hope is in a God and a Savior who never fails. Never fails. We must be willing to witness together that that is the truth and that is where our hope lies. And He calls us not only to witness together and to worship together but he also calls us to work together verse 24 says and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works you want to make an impact in our society you want to make a difference in this world then be a difference because of the hope that's in you because of the working out of the holy spirit in your life because of the direction that he puts in front of you then Do that, but also encourage one another. Now, how are you going to encourage other people to do what they ought to be or to do if you're never around them? We need to be willing to say, I'm going to come and do my part to build up the body of Christ so that we can go out as an army of believers into a world that is lost and hopeless and in darkness and illuminate them with the light of Christ that is within us. We ought to encourage each other to love. Let us consider how to stir one another to love. We, we don't just have a responsibility to worship Jesus and to witness for him. We have a responsibility to do it with each other. Christianity is a team sport. We, we get so focused sometimes on the bad church members that we quit. But the church is not bad. It's incredibly good. It is a gift from God sometimes the people in church do bad things and and we tend to want to focus on that but remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 after his resurrection he said I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it now that doesn't mean everybody in the church will always do the right thing but the church itself is a gift from God to those of us who are striving to follow the direction that he's laid out in front of us how many of you ever played on a team sport 
basketball, football, softball, baseball, volleyball, soccer. Nobody. Okay, you've heard of team sports though, right? This is not a new concept. Okay, so I, have you ever had a bad teammate? I, I mean, I have. I, when I played football, we had a lot of sorry teammates. I mean, there were some just didn't want to do what they needed to do. They, they wouldn't practice hard. They wouldn't show up to practice sometimes. Many times they would complain about everything. This is too hard. We're tired. Why can't we stop? Why can't we just have more fun? There was always something. They never gave any effort, but they were always constantly complaining about the fact that they didn't get any playing time either. That was always frustrating to me. You don't even show up to practice, and now you want to play in the game. That's kind of frustrating. I remember one of my teammates in a practice when I was in ninth grade and I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, but he wasn't. And in order to cover his tracks for not doing what he was supposed to be doing, he lunged and speared me in the knee and dislocated my knee. Now, he did it. It was a dirty move. He did it on purpose because he knew he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do, and he just kind of did it at the last second. I didn't know it at the time, but that particular injury would ultimately be the reason why I would never get to play football again after my senior year of high school. I also remember another teammate of mine who we were gone to an away game and while we were at the away game playing in the, in the other city against the other team, this teammate had conspired with a person back in our hometown to break into several cars in the parking lot. And in my particular truck, they stole the car stereo and some jewelry that was in there. I know that my teammate conspired because the next week I actually saw his girlfriend wearing the gold cross necklace that Beth had given to me for Christmas. But there was no way for us to prove that that's what had happened, and ultimately they got away with it. But I knew, my t and everybody else knew that he was a part of it as well. Both of those guys were bad teammates. But you know what I didn't do? I didn't quit the football team because of it. I didn't stop going to practice. I didn't stop playing because we had teammates that didn't do what they were supposed to do. Or in some cases, teammates that did things they shouldn't have done. I still put in the time and the energy and the effort to be the best that I could be. And our football team went on to win three consecutive state championships. We won 44 consecutive games in a row while I was playing. But if I'd quit the football team, I'd have missed all the celebrations. I'd have missed all the championship rings. I would have missed every one of the parades that we got to go on. If I'd let bad teammates keep me away from all of the good that came from being a part of the team, I'd have missed out on all of the stuff that was the reason why I played in the first place. Yes, there are people in church that don't do things the way they should do them. You don't have to explain that to us. We've met people. We've talked to people. We've had encounters with folks that just are sort of in it for themselves. And they're everywhere. And it's not like you come into the church and we are protected from people that are bent towards doing selfish things. That's just the reality of it. But that is not God's people. That is not God. That is not indicative of His church that's not what we ought to focus on what we ought to focus on is not what is it that i can get out of this we ought to focus on what is it that god wants me to put into this because ultimately at the end of the day the response to bad teammates is not to be a bad teammate the response to bad teammates is to say we have to pick each other up and be the best we can possibly be for the glory of God and to help those that are lost and searching out in this world. We ought to encourage one another to love and encourage one another to serve. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. There, there's something that needs to be done. Don't, don't leave. Don't run. Don't quit recognize the fact that God's desire for us is that we would be able to do what He has called us to do. And there's so much work that needs to be done. We must be willing to work together. And then finally in this passage of Scripture in verse 25, after He's told us these three things, let us, let us, let us, now He reminds us that ultimately the purpose of all of this is that we should walk together. 
if we're going to worship together and witness together, we're going to work together, then ultimately that requires us to actually go through this life together. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The church is a good thing. It's a good place to be. It's a good place to find hope and assurance and encouragement. Yeah, but you don't understand the people in church have hurt me. More than the people outside the church have hurt you. More than the chaos and the evil and the pain and the suffering that we endure when we're not here. Yeah, okay, sometimes the people in the church do things they should not do. But here's what he's saying. When you don't come, you miss the opportunities that God has given you to accomplish what he created you to accomplish. He gave us each other to be able to do this. I, I told you what you ought to do together. But now the author of Hebrews said, now I want to remind you of how important it is from now on to do it together. People had stopped coming. They weren't rejecting church. They were neglecting the church. Many of them weren't saying, oh, we, don't, we don't think the church is good. They were just not going. Did you know the church actually needs for you to be here? Needs for you to be participating? Needs for you to be worshiping? Needs for you to be serving? Needs for God doesn't, but the church does. Remember, He didn't design it for His benefit. He designed it for our benefit so that we would have a fueling station to come and receive from Him what we needed to bring glory and honor to Him throughout the week and to do the work that He called us to do. So don't miss this opportunity. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. Some people don't recognize the importance of it. But don't be like that. You need this time. You need to make sure that you recognize this opportunity is great. And then finally he says, don't waste your time. In other words, we ought to do this even more urgently, even more urgently as the day is drawing near. Don't miss the opportunity, but don't waste your time. If there's ever been a time when we need each other, now is the time. It's not getting better. I mean, you, you look around and it seems pretty obvious that the world's not getting better. That shouldn't surprise us. If we've been reading his word at all, then we, we know that Jesus spoke many times about the fact that it was going to get worse as the day draws near. What day? What day is he talking about? The day drawing near is the day of the return of Christ. The end of time. As the end draws near, we need each other more. Not less. We, we need to recognize that Back to Church Sunday ought to be an every church fill-up Sunday. It, it ought to be an opportunity for every one of us to say, okay, I need it even more. This week, you know, there's just some times when I just need it more. Like I've been especially drained that week. And I just need to be with God's people it's one of my favorite times of the week. Well, you have to say that. You're, you're the pastor. Trust me, I don't have to say it. Trust me, there's times when it feels like to, to go is to be drained, right? You know, what, you know what I'm talking about. There are times when it just feels like everybody just wants to pull you in different directions. And yet, in spite of that, every time I come, no matter what my hesitation may be, every time I come, God does a different and new work in me through His Word and through worshiping Him and through being with His people. There's always encouragement. There's always people that are coming up to me and saying, hey, I prayed for you this week. And there's always people that are coming up to me and saying, hey, listen, your message last week was especially especially strengthening to me for my situation. And, and it's so important for us to recognize that in order to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish as individuals, we need each other together. Now, how do we do this? What does it look like? Well, we just kind of walked through it, but God encourages us to worship together. He encourages us to use our gifts to serve Him and to serve each other and to serve the people that He's going to put in our path to share the gospel with. He encourages us to find ourselves in small groups for Bible study, not neglecting coming together, meeting together, encouraging one another, stirring each other up 
for love, and he encourages us to witness, to tell our story. You, you know, one of the powerful things about your story is that you rely upon God. And that's why coming to church is so important. Look at what I'm able to do because of what God is doing in my heart and what he's doing through other people in my life. There was a banker in a large city who every day as he was leaving work would toss a coin in the cup of this legless beggar who sat out on the street right outside the bank where he worked. But unlike most people, the banker would always insist on taking one of the pencils that the man was supposedly selling. You're a merchant, he would say to him. The banker would say, I always expect to receive good value from merchants that I do business with. So he would put money in, he would take a pencil out. One day, the legless man was not there on the sidewalk. He thought that was odd. He wasn't real sure where he could have gone and certainly wasn't sure where he did go. So time passed and ultimately, eventually, the banker kind of forgot about him. But then one day he walked into a public building and there in the concession stand sat that former beggar. He was obviously the owner of his small business now. He said to him, you know, I've always hoped that you might come into my store someday because you are largely responsible for me being here. You kept telling me that I was a merchant. And I started thinking of myself that way instead of being a beggar. Instead of just receiving gifts, I started selling pencils. Lots of pencils. <laughs> you gave me self-respect. It caused me to look at myself completely differently than I had in the past. You know, the problem is, many times when we stop coming... We stop coming because we stop thinking we're receiving what we need to receive. One of the things that God reminds us about this gift that he has given to us is that we've received everything that we need to receive from him. Our responsibility now is to give what we've received to him to others. Now here's the beautiful part of this. If you give of yourself for the glory of God and for the betterment of others, not loving yourself but loving others, you know what you'll find? Everything that you need to receive, God provides. He provides from Himself, from His Spirit, and through the people that you will encounter. But it's one of the glorious things about the church. When you give, you always receive. Instead of coming to church and thinking, what have you done for me lately? Wouldn't it be so much better if we came to church and realized He doesn't need to do anything else for us. Jesus has already torn the veil, provided access to the very throne of God because of His death, burial, and resurrection. Now we have a Savior that has prepared a place for us so that where He is, we can always be. Instead of coming to church and saying, God, what can you do for me today? Why don't we come to church and say, God, I'm here. What would you like for me to do for you today? This is your time, Father, for your glory, for your kingdom. How can I help somebody else? How can I use my gifts for your glory? How can I be what you created me to be, to worship with your people, to witness with your people, to work with your people, to walk with your people until you call us all home to be with you as your people forever? This is what it means to be the church. And yeah, there's bad church members. But don't be the bad church member. Recognize that God has redeemed you to be more. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, I don't, I don't know that I really am one of his children. Well, there's no time like today to say, here I am, Lord. I've tried it my way. Here I am. What do you want to do with me? Would you bow your heads with me this morning as we close?